So welcome back to time series analysis. Right now we are doing what's going to be the screencast for the fifth lecture. And today we'll focus again on stochastic processes. And first we'll look at it in general. Then we'll look into so-called moving average, autoregressive and combined processes, some stationarity, and at the end, what is called optimal prediction. So, first of all, in general, what is a stochastic process? It's a function, depends on time, that comes from some sample space and time, and we have some realizations that are also from a particular sample space. So it could be that you have numbers from R, and then this is the realization that we have for this particular observation. So we have an index set for time, and we have a sample space, omega, and that's how we look at it. So that's a generic definition of things. That also means that if we look at a particular point in time, then a stochastic process is just an ordinary random variable. Now, if you look at a particular sample, a realization, then you have what we will be looking at a lot in this course, namely a time series. One realization, and we will often just denote it lowercase xt, because now we have observed it, so now it's known. So in this course, we will focus on things that are measured in discrete time, but of course, there will also be cases where you can do things in continuous time, but that outside the scope of this course. As an example, here we have three different realization, omega 1, 2, and 3. And if you look at a particular time point, then you have a distribution here where you have three realization of that particular random variable at that particular point in time. So what most often happens is that you only get one realization of a, s a process, but then you have to say something about the generic overall process that is behind that. And that's where we're getting at in the future from here. Now, the totally complete characterization of a stochastic process. For now, we'll be in discrete time, so that the joint density of the distribution at all the times where we have observations. So that's the joint density of a very high dimension, often because you have many observations and time points. So what we have is a probability density function, and it's for all time points, as said. And effectively, we can pick them as we wish. But in practice, what we'll do is that we'll have discrete time points that are at regular time intervals. So what we call this is the so-called family of finite dimensional probability density functions, or PDFs, for this particular process. And this is the complete characterization, this is the theoretical foundation behind everything that we're going to do from now on. In practice, as mentioned earlier, we will mostly look at things that comes from the normal distribution, which also means that we are good to go and we have all the information that we need if we have the second order moment representation in place. So we will look at the mean value, as in the expected value, and that is just as we've seen it before, for a particular point in time, we have a density, we have a random variable, and so on, we just have to move on. Everything is pretty much as it has been always. And for the autocovariance, then we have two different time points. We're looking at how is the covariance between time one and time two. Well, that is the covariance between the random variable at time one and the random variable at time t2. And the equations there are exactly the same as what we've done previously. Now, so what we're doing here, if we look at it, this definition, so we have 
the autocovariance function, I will just leave it out here. So I have it for memory that we have gamma of t1, comma t2 is equal to the covariance between x at t1 and x at t2. So that's what we're going to use and keep in mind whenever we're going to look at this. And of course, when we have the autocovariance, then we also have the variance. Because what we have here, well, that's just with the same time, so it's respect to yourself, picking t1 equals to t2, and we have the variance. So that is straightforward and pretty much what we've done previously as well. Now, one thing that is important when we look at stochastic processes is whether they are stationary or not. And what does it mean for a process to be stationary? Well, there's dif different degrees of stationarity, first of all. So the strongest part is called strongly stationary. And that is if all finite dimensional distribution are invariant to changes in time. So that means you can pick any n time points and any set of time points. And then if the density, the joint density is the same irrespective of a shift in time, because that's what is happening here. That's the only difference. If the distribution is invariant to shifts in time, then the process is said to be strongly stationary. Often what we will deal with is so-called weakly stationary of a particular order, k. Now, what that holds is that the first k moments have to be invariant to changes over time. So invariant of order 1, of weakly stationary of order 1, means that the mean value is stationary, is fixed, constant, and independent of changes in time. Order 2 means that besides the mean value, you also need to have a constant variance. And the covariance, well, if it's the density is only if the same irrespective of shifts in time, it also means that it doesn't matter when you measure t1 and t2. What matters is the distance between t1 and t2. So the covariance becomes a function of the time difference if it is a weakly stationary process of order two. One of the more, you can say, mind-boggling phenomena is so-called acoudicity. So what we usually have is that we have some time, and then we have one realization of a process. But what we care about is not necessarily the particular realization. So this is as mentioned earlier, we have all the time points, and then we have a particular omega, as that is the particular realization that we have. What we care about is what can we say about the underlying process, stochastic process that is there. So what we often want to require is that the process is so-called mean agotic. That means that the expectation at a particular point in time well, what we would want to do is to do it for the known density of the particular variable at the particular, for all realizations, but in practice we only have one. So if the process is so-called mean agotic, it means that we can just do the integral of the realization that we have, and then as we increase the time window around the desired time point, then we get in the limit where time is going to infinity, then we get the right value. So it means if the mean of the ensemble equals the mean over time, which will often be the case, at least for all the processes we're going to look at here. And I added a small link here down to say if you want to have more discussions about 
what is agrodiscity. So, as said, we will focus on Gaussian processes, also called normal processes, and in those cases, then are all the finite dimensional distribution functions, they can be treated as multivariate normal distributions. So, we are back to what we looked at in the previous lectures. Now, we also have so-called Markov processes, and what we have here is basically saying that the conditional distribution is only dependent on the latest state of the process. So, if you're looking at the probability here of xtn less than or equal x, given all the previous observations, if that only depends on the most recent observation and not the future, uh, not the previous ones, then our process fulfills the Markov property. A dismissic process is a process where we can predict without uncertainty, just that given the past observations, then we can predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, we also have so-called pure stochastic process, and then we are looking at linear combinations of uncorrelated random variables and potentially an infinite set of linear combinations. And that's what we're going to spend the most time on, things that we can look at as a pure stochastic process. But what is important is to think of whenever you observe something, it may have a stochastic component and it may have a deterministic component. And sometimes if we know stuff about one, then it's much easier to kind of decompose the original, the problem into two parts where if one is easy, the other one typically also gets more easy. Now, the next element here is the autocovariance and autocorrelation. What we mentioned earlier on is that for stationary processes, well, then it only depends on the time difference. And rather than writing T2 and T1 all the time, we will just use tor as a time difference when looking at the autocovariance. So rather than having the definition up here, we will use gamma, do that nicer, gamma of tor equals the covariance of x t and x t plus tor. Like that. Okay, so that's the order co covariance, and as we did for the non time series stochastic process part, we just look at a distribution. If you want to go for the covariance to the autocorrelation, co well, basically, you just have to normalize the autocovariance with the autocorrelation. That's one important thing here that is just to understand. What is the difference between just covariance and autocovariance? Because effectively what we're calculating out here are just covariances. And I did one assumption out here, which you may see or may not see, but think of it for a while. What I wanted to say is that the auto here comes from Greek and means with yourself. So this is covariance with yourself, rather than just covariance of some random matrix or random vector, then it's with yourself. Now, the assumption that I made out here is that I did not subtract the mean value of the process both places, which is the usual thing you do when you do the calculation of the covariance. So I assume that the mean value is zero. I will do that repeatedly without laws of generality. That's something we can often do, and it will make a lot of calculations easier. Of course, not always, but it's your task to figure out when is it fine, when is it not fine. So a couple of properties of the autocovariance function. First of all, 
if you go forward in time or backwards in time, the covariance, uh, covariance is the same. It's kind of obvious when looking at this product, if it is stationary, sweetly stationary of order two of the process, well, then shifting time, say tall backwards, gives us the same distribution because that's what it's meant to be. Otherwise, it's not weak stationary of order two. And it should only be the time difference that matters. So it do doesn't matter if you have it at one point in time or at some other point in time. And if you look at the, the variance and you look at any other time point, then the absolute value of the autocovariance is always numerically less than or equal to the autocovariance. Well, that's kind of obvious because otherwise the correlation could be greater than one because we define it as the autocovariance divided by the variance. And if this could be numerically greater than one, then we we'll also have that the um, Correlation would be numerically greater than one, which per definition doesn't happen. So let's take that for granted. 